Are you ready for God's word this morning, church? You were very enthusiastic about it. Are you ready for God's word this morning? All right. We're in the middle of a message series called Encounters with Jesus. Encounters with Jesus. And let me tell you, as we've come back together as a church in the building online, let me tell you, we are not just ticking a church box here today. We're here for an encounter with Jesus. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at different people who had significant encounters with Jesus. And as a result, their life has never been the same again. And today, we're going to continue to look at another group of people or another person in the Bible who had significant encounters with Jesus in the Bible. In the book of John chapter 6, we read about Jesus feeding the 5,000. This was one of Jesus' well-known miracles in the Bible, recorded in the Bible. Here is a group of people, thousands of people gathered to hear Jesus preach and teach and perform miracles. I love this about Jesus. Everywhere he went, multitudes followed him. They were drawn to his teachers, uh, teaching. They were drawn to his miracles. Here they were, Jesus been teaching and preaching for a long time, and, and people were starting to get hungry. In many ways, in other words, Jesus was, you know, preaching for a while, and they were starting to get hungry. And the disciples were like, hey, how are we going to feed this crowd? Because there's a lot of people here. They did their calculations. They did their projections. And they looked at the budget and they were like, there is no way we can feed a crowd this size. All they had was a little boy's lunch and bread and fish. And, and we know the story. They gave it to Jesus and Jesus multiplied it. And thousands of people were fed. Can I tell you, there's a story. There's a powerful miracle. When you place what you have in the hand of a more almighty God, miracles happen. So don't worry about what you don't have. Step out with what you have. So they stepped out with what they had and they gave it to Jesus and he fed multitudes of people. In fact, there were leftovers. Then we read something very interesting in verse 22. We find the next morning, the crowd gathering again, looking for Jesus. They were really impressed by what he did Yesterday, here they were, they were looking for their next meal ticket. They were like, hey, Jesus, where are you? Can you do this again? They're looking for an encore performance. Eventually, they realized that Jesus and the disciples had crossed to the other side of the lake. So they start looking for Jesus. So by the time they caught up with Jesus, they are starving. They missed their breakfast. Now they're like, Jesus, what's on the menu for lunch? I was having lunch with a group of people the other day, and I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever noticed sometimes when you're hanging out with people, you're having lunch, and then you're talking about your next meal? Very strange. You're having lunch, and you're talking about dinner. I was like, what's wrong with all of us? So here, they, they, you know, they, they miss breakfast, and they're like, Jesus, what's on the lunch for menu? What's on the menu for lunch? Come on, do something. And then Jesus said this to them in verse 26, John 6, verse 26, in your notes on the app, watching online piece of paper, you're in the building, whatever. Most important thing in your Bibles. Jesus answered, you've come looking for me not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you, filled your stomachs, and for free. Jesus knew that these people, they had gone to all the trouble and effort and sacrifice to get here, not because they were following him. They simply wanted free food. They weren't looking for Jesus. They were looking for the next meal. He knew they were fans, not followers. Was it, was it Jesus they wanted, or were they more interested in what he could do for them? Sometimes we come to church and doing worship and doing the message, whether you're watching online, but sometimes we need to ask ourselves, am I following God? Am I pursuing God or am I pursuing the blessing or what he can do for me? See, listen to what Jesus said to them in verse 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Everybody say bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So Jesus is saying, hey guys, you want to know what's on the menu? Me. Me. I am your lunch. You need to make a decision. Do you want me or do you want what I can't give you food right now? Are you hungry for me or are you hungry for something else? And that is a decision that you have to make. Can I tell you, in the times that we are living right now, all of us have to ask this question. 
Am I following him? Am I hungry for him? Or am I hungry for what he can do for me? And look what happens in verse uh, 66, John 6, verses 66 to 67. It says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? In fact, many people walked away when they realized he wasn't going to give them free food. They walked away. They, they took off. Here's the truth. Jesus it wasn't the size of the crowd he cared about. It was their level of commitment. It wasn't the size of the crowd. Jesus wasn't after a crowd. He was looking for their commitment. This morning, I want to ask all of us this question. Am I a fan of Jesus or am I a follower of Jesus? A fan or a follower? There's a big difference between a fan and a follower. A fan is an, is an enthusiastic admirer. See, there are many fan clubs right now for celebrities, movie stars, sports clubs. You know, everybody, you know, we have people that we love, we look up to, we are, we're fans of. See, fans claim to know everything about a certain person, but it's unlikely they've actually met that person. See, a, a fan just shows up and they will stay as long as they want, as long as it benefits them. There's something in it for you or for me. We'll, we'll, we'll hang in there. We'll stay there. And, you know, they're there as long as they get something out of it, but they give up and walk away the moment they're offended or they're not happy with the decision this person's made. See, fans are fickle. Their loyalty can be changed in a moment. I'll never forget when I was about 21 years old, I just started leading worship. I, you know, I'd just come on staff at church and, and the worship pastor back then said to me, look, uh, it's Christmas time. We've had a request from one of the retirement villages down the road. They've asked uh, you know, for someone to come and sing a few carols. And she said to me, would you mind going and doing it? I was like, that's fine, no worries. I took a couple of kids from the youth group and we sang some Christmas carols. And there's one particular lady, she was like, wow, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. She was like, oh, I love carols. She was smiling. Afterwards, I said to the youth group, hey, let's all go around, shake hands, and say Merry Christmas. So I remember going and shaking this hands, a lady's hand, and just saying, hey, Merry Christmas. She was like, oh, you weren't my cup of tea. I really didn't like that. I was like, but during the singing, you were like, wow, this is amazing. She was like, no, I've changed my mind. She was like, I've changed my mind. No, you guys are not my cup of tea. I'm glad it's over. See, fans are fickle. And then she said this to me. I don't know what she was thinking. She was like, Could you, can you talk to the management and get them to change my carpet for me? I was like, I don't work here. So immediately, I was no longer needed. Next year, I was not available. I'm so sorry. I've got demands now. I've got expectations. But anyway, different story. But I'm trying to say this. Fans are fickle. Listen to Jesus. You know, this happened to Jesus. One minute they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. They were waving palm branches. They took the clothes and they put it on the, on the ground and they worshiped him. And the next thing they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Can I tell you, don't live for the applause of man. Live for an audience of one. So fans are fickle, but a follower, on the other hand, puts that one person above everything else and, in fact, shapes their whole life around that person. You know, that's why I love when Jeff came up for a crunchy celebrating 50 years with Jesus. Can we give God praise for that? Let me tell you, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to celebrate. You can't just be a fan of Jesus for 50 years. You know, the, the followers, they, they put Jesus first. The disciples, they left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, come, follow me. They left their families, their jobs, everything that they owned, and they followed him. Write this down. Fans know about Jesus. Followers get to know Jesus. Fans know about Jesus. Followers get to know Jesus. Fans put their focus on the outward appearance. They want to look the part. They want everybody to know, hey, I'm a fan of this person or the sports team. In fact, if you're at a sports gathering, you need to be careful who's, who, you know, whose jersey you've got on. You, you've got the wrong jersey and you're sitting on the wrong side. You may get in trouble because it's all about the outward appearance. You want everybody to know who you're supporting. But a follower has an inner passion for who they are following. It's not about the outward appearance. They don't really care about what other people think. That, you know, for them, it's a genuine, heartfelt passion that shapes their whole world. So I want to ask you a question today. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? But I want to be very clear about something. If you're a fan of Jesus, this is not a message to beat you up or make you feel guilty or to point the finger at you. 
my prayer, my goal for this message is that if you are a fan of Jesus, I pray that today you will become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Why? Because that's where real life is found. Every single one of us, fan or follower, needs to be intentionally always be evaluating our relationship with Jesus. Why? Because we're only as good as our relationship with Jesus. So this is not a message to pull anyone down. This is a message to help people become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. Maybe your relationship with Jesus has become stale. And, and I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will refire you this morning to, to keep going and to keep pursuing Jesus. But in order to do that, there are four questions that I want us to look at this morning. In order to evaluate our relationship with Jesus and to ask ourselves this question, am I an enthusiastic admirer of Jesus? Am I a fan or a fully devoted follower of Jesus? Four questions that we're gonna look at together. Let's write this down in our notes. Number one, have I made a decision or a commitment? Have I made a decision or a commitment? It is a decision or a commitment because there's a big difference. A decision to believe in Jesus Without a commitment to follow, Jesus only makes me a fan of Jesus. A decision to believe without a commitment to follow only makes me a fan of Jesus. You see, a commitment to follow Jesus means change. You know, I'm no longer the same person I was before I, I met Jesus. Let, let me tell you, I can't follow Jesus and stay the same. I'm all in. I, my life is no longer mine. I belong to Jesus. Listen carefully. There is no forgiveness without repentance. There is no salvation without surrender. There is no life without death. There is no believing without committing. Is it a decision? Or have I, or am I, or have I made a commitment? And I want us to look at an amazing story in John chapter three. We read about a man named Nicodemus. He was a well-known religious leader. Here is Nicodemus. He's ready to, to, you know, take his relationship with Jesus to another level. But it wasn't easy. There would be much to lose if he went public as a follower of Jesus. What would happen if people found out that Nicodemus was going to become a follower of Jesus? He probably would lose his reputation. He would lose his position as a religious leader. Being a secret admirer of Jesus cost him nothing. But becoming a following, follower of Jesus came with a high price tag. It always does. Nicodemus was at a crossroad. Am I going to choose religion or am I going to have a relationship? Can I tell you, church, you can't have both. You need to make a decision. Do I want religion or do I want a relationship? There's no way for him to become a truly true follower of Jesus without losing his religion. Can I tell you, religion will always get in the way when you want to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Let's look at the story, John 3, verses 1 to 2. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, everybody say after dark. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Interesting passage of Scripture. Interesting story. It says, after dark. Why is Nicodemus meeting with Jesus in the dark? He could have met Jesus anywhere during the daytime. Jesus was out in public. Jesus was never hiding in secret, having secret gatherings. Why did he wait till it was dark? Why? Because he didn't want anyone to see him. He wanted to be a fan, a secret admirer of Jesus. Maybe he thought, I could have a relationship with Jesus without having to make any real changes. Maybe I can meet with Jesus without it impacting my job. No one would know. My friends and family wouldn't know. Doesn't muck things up. Doesn't rock the boat. Jesus, let's just keep this moving. You and me, let's just keep it private. Let me, let's not disrupt, disrupt my comfortable, established life. Hey, let's just do this quietly with no disruptions. Let me tell you, that's what a secret fan would do. Fans are happy to follow Jesus as long as it does not require any significant changes or implications in their life. You see, many people don't mind Jesus making minor changes 
in their life. But can I tell you, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make minor changes in our lives. No, He wants to turn your life upside down, inside out. He wants to change us. See, when you encounter with Jesus, you're never the same again. Often we say, Jesus, I don't mind you doing some touch-up work. Just touch-up work here and there. Let's not mess things up. Let's just touch up work. Can I tell you, Jesus wants to do more than touch up work. He wants to do a complete renovation. So often we say, Jesus, we know it's okay. You know, just do a little bit of makeup here and there. Just, you know, just touch up here and there. No, no, Jesus wants to do a complete makeover. We think, Jesus, oh, you know, that was a good message. Yeah, yeah, just a few decorations here and there. No, no, no. He wants to do a complete remodel. He wants to change us from inside out. I remember a lady many years ago said to us, I need help decluttering our house, my house. There's a lot of stuff in my house. Can you please help us? I was like, cool. Shades and I showed up. We were like, okay, what needs to be taken? What needs to be put in the rubbish bin? So we would take up some old boxes. And she was like, oh, no, 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 not that box. No, 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 please. Leave that over there. No, no, not that one. I was like, okay, what about this box? Oh, no, no, not that, not that, not that. A chair with three legs. What, can we throw this? Oh, no, 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 no. No, you can't throw that. But what, can we empty the fridge? Oh, no, no. I got my dinner last night and everything. Oh, no, you can't. Just, uh, I was like, what do you want to throw? Do, is there anything you want to throw here? She was like, not really. Not really. Like, then what, is, what are we trying to do here? See, sometimes we do that with Jesus. Jesus, you can have that, but you can't have this. Oh, God, I I agree with this part of the Bible, but I don't agree with that part of the Bible. Jesus, you can have access to that area of my life, but not this. Can I tell you, Jesus doesn't want to just inspire us. He wants to transform us. What are some areas in my life, in your life right now, that we haven't given him access to? John 3, 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus makes it very clear to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, it is not your religious acts. It's not your rules and regulations. They are not the measurements. Instead, Jesus said, you must humble yourself and be born again in a whole new way of life. Jesus didn't want Nicodemus to just stay a fan. He wanted to become a follower of Jesus. He didn't want him in the dark during nighttime. Jesus wanted him during the daytime as well. In other words, for today, for all of us, Jesus didn't want Nicodemus just on a Sunday. He wanted him on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Is it a decision or is it a commitment? That's a challenge for all of us. Many make a decision to believe in Jesus without making a a commitment to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, Christianity is more than a decision. It is more than a verbal acknowledgement. It's more than just raising our, our hands at the end of a message and praying a prayer, even though that is absolutely important. Jesus is looking for more than words of belief. He's looking to see how these words are lived out in our lives. To truly believe is to follow. At the end of the message today, just like we do every Sunday, I'm going to give you an invitation to, to put your hand up and say, yes, boy, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I pray that today you need to make that decision that I'm no, no longer going to be a fan of Jesus that is just believing, but I'm going to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Maybe you walked away from God. Maybe you said, boy, maybe you were like, boy, I did have a relationship with God and and I've moved away or things happen and I've fallen behind. Can I tell you, it's never too late. The Father is waiting and He wants to say to you, come home, my son, come home, my daughter. You may be watching online. Can I tell you, I pray. Maybe some of you, you need to recommit your life to Jesus. Don't be a fan of Jesus. Become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Why? Because that's where real life is. Have I made a decision or a commitment? Number two, do I just know about Jesus or do I, do I, or do I really know Him? Do I just know about Jesus or do I really know Him? See, fans can confuse knowledge for intimacy. They don't recognize the difference between knowing about Jesus and truly knowing Jesus. Fans know about Jesus. Disciples, followers get to know Jesus. When the Bible uses the word know, it means more than knowledge. Listen carefully. Reading about swimming doesn't make me a swimmer. 
Watching YouTube about swimming doesn't make me a swimmer. You know, you've got to get in the water and start swimming. Just knowing about Jesus is not enough. You've got to spend time with him. See, a, fa- a lot of Pharisees, they knew about Jesus, but they didn't really know him. And in Luke chapter 7, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. I read that story. I had to stop and ask myself, Who am I in that story? Who am I in that story? Ask yourself this question. Who am I in that story? When was the last time I had an encounter with Jesus? When was the last time I poured out my heart to Him? When was the last time tears streamed down my face as I expressed my life, love for God? When was the last time I demonstrated my love for Him with reckless abandonment? I said to a group of pastors, I no longer want our pastors and leaders and our, and our staff, anybody walking with the Lord. I don't want to go to a worship gathering. I'm actually there singing the songs, but I'm thinking about the, or the sound or the overhead projector or this or that, and I'm, I'm distracted by what is happening on the outside. No, I want God to change me from the inside out. I don't want to just read the Bible and I'm like, oh, that's a good sermon that we'll preach for Sunday. That's wonderful. No, I don't want to just read the Bible and go like that. Why? Because that's just words. When I read the Bible, it needs to go from there to here and to there. Why? Because if it just goes from here to there, it's just words. But when you read, I mean, it goes into your heart and you live it. Let me tell you, that's the best message ever preached. The ones that we live out. When was the last time we spent time with Jesus where we had an encounter with Him? Number three, Am I following Jesus or am I simply following the rules? Let me tell you, Christianity is is not about a, sorry, Christianity is about a relationship. It's not about a performance. It's about a relationship. During the week as I was preparing for this, I came across a story of this man named Matt Emmons. Matt Emmons was an American sports shooter. One shot away from claiming the victory at the 2004 Olympics. He didn't even need a bullseye to win it. All he needed was a score of 8.1, which was more than enough for him to win an Olympic medal. Matt Emmons fired the shot. The crowd was cheering. One problem. He shot the wrong target. He went for someone else's target. And he missed out. And instead of winning the gold medal, he actually ended up in eighth place. Can I tell you, that's what religion will cause you to do. Religion will cause us to go for the wrong target. If you ask a lot of fans, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? A lot of people would say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus. When you hear that, it's not a question of they're following hard, but here's the problem. They're not following Jesus. We're following Focused on the outside while a follower is forced to, forced to focus on the inside. Fans are worried about the exterior. Followers are concerned or focused on the interior. That's why the Bible says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at our hearts. And listen to what Jesus says again in Matthew 23, 27 to 28. Hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Let me tell you, religion is all about going through the motions. I'm just going through my religious activities. It's just going through the stuff. But let me tell you, fans grow tired after a while. Because why? You don't have that passion anymore. Religion is more focused on the outside than the inside. Religion forces you to choose law over grace, guilt over grace. Religion will point you to the wrong target. Maybe you're here today and you're like, boy, I'm a fan of Jesus. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. This is what Jesus is saying to you today. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Are you tired? 
worn out, burnt out on religion, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay, any, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Can I tell you, if you're tired and exhausted of religion, here's my encouragement to you. Stop living according to the patterns of this world. Start living according to the rhythms of His grace. Jesus is saying, come, come, come. It's about a relationship. If I could ask Duncan to join me on the keys, please. Number four, am I a self-empowered fan or a spirit-filled follower? Am I a self-empowered fan or a spirit-filled follower? Listen to what the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and at the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up to a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. Can I tell you, if you're a fan of Jesus, eventually... You will run out. Eventually, you will get burned up. But if you're a follower of Jesus, this is what He's promised us, His Holy Spirit. He gives you supernatural strength and the power that you need. I'm going to close with this story. Maybe I may have shared it before. I'll never forget one time we were driving and the petrol light came on. And Shane said to me, Boyd, we should pull over and fill up. The petrol light's on. I said, Shash, don't you know that if the petrol light's on, you can go on for another 22 k's? She has never heard of it. She was like, boy, there's mobile. We should stop. I'm like, nah, we'll be fine. Be a man of faith. Every petrol station, she was like, come on. We should go. I'm like, oh, we'll be fine. 22 k's. We'll be fine. And the car stopped. I was shocked. I was like, that wasn't 22 k. I was embarrassed to get out and carry the petrol can down the street because the church was just around the corner. I was like, people can see him. Flip, flip. So we had to ring Pastor Haley Barrett to come and give us some petrol. And now there are people here today, petrol lights on spiritually. We think, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll just keep going. Let me tell you, that's what religion will tell you to do. But today God is saying, come, come, come. That's an invitation. While every eye closed, every head bowed, today, if you're burned on religion and you're saying, boy, I want to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. I want to give you an invitation this morning. The Bible says sin separates us from God. But here's the good news. Jesus came and He died on the cross to, to, to break that barrier, to get rid of sin so that you can have a relationship with Jesus. I want everybody in this room and watching online for a moment to stop and to reevaluate your life. Am I a fan or a follower? I pray that today you're like, Boyd, I want to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. I want my past forgiven. I want my future secured in Jesus. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus took your place. You can't save yourself. The church can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. If you're here today and in a moment I'd love to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask every single person in this room to pray this prayer after me online. You can pray this prayer with me. Repeat this prayer wherever you are. I want you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart where you're saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I want you in my life. I'm making a commitment to follow you. Come on, let's pray this prayer all across this room. Everybody online, let's pray it out nice and loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, confess I'm a I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I declare you're the Lord of my life. I invite you into my life. Change me from the inside out. I believe in Jesus. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. I want you to quickly put your hand up. And it's not just a religious thing that you're doing. But today what you're saying is, Boyd, I'm no longer a fan 
I'm no longer meeting with Jesus in secret. Today I'm publicly acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of my life. He is the Lord over my life in every area of my life. Let me tell you, every time a hand goes up, there's a party happening in heaven. So watching online, you go ahead and press that button that will pop up in a minute. But if you're in the room, I want you to quickly put your hand up. That brother's already putting his hand up. Wherever you are, you put your hand up. One, two, three. Come on, come on, let's celebrate. Yes, over there. Anyone else? Yes, over here, over here, over there. Come on, let's celebrate every person who's saying yes to Jesus. Two things I want you to remember. If you said yes to Jesus, I want you to go ahead, text the word yes to 4040. Somebody will get in touch with you. On your way out, you will see a team of people with blue t-shirts with the words count me in. They want to give you a Bible. They want to pray with you. And here's the best part. On Easter Sunday, we have baptisms happening. Can I encourage you? Baptism is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Let's follow the footsteps of Jesus. You've made the best decision of your life. Come on, let's put our hands together one more time. Celebrate every person that said yes to Jesus. But as we were worshiping, if you're watching online, I don't want you to log out in a moment. Oh, no, log out right now. Don't, just please stay. <laughs> please stay. Jesus is watching. This is what I want all of us to do. Maybe you're like, boy, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Let me tell you, the season that we've been as a church, the last two years, it's been crazy. It's been messy. It's been painful. It's been hard. But I already felt during worship, God say to me, Boyd, you need to get the whole church. If you're comfortable doing this, you don't have to do this. I really believe all of us, we need to get on our knees for a moment and say, Jesus, I recommit to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And I pray that all of us here in this place, that as we walk out, nobody needs to walk out of this building in shame, in guilt, in pain, worry, fear, anxiety. Why? Because you are a child of God. I'm going to ask Tony just to sing that chorus a couple of times. Oh God, oh God, I need to. Would you get on your knees if you're watching online? You need to do that at home. All of us, for a moment, can we just get on our knees and say, Jesus, I thank you that you took my place. You don't have to do this. I'm not forcing anybody to do it, but I leave the Holy Spirit remind me and say, hey, let's get on our knees. If we can get on our knees before God, you can stand before anyone. Thank you, Tony. Just take a few moments. You feel free to lift your hands and worship and say, God, I need you. I need you. God, I no longer want religion. I just don't want to go through the motions of a service. But God, I need an encounter. I need a significant encounter in the name of Jesus.